live now. No, this is only me being live this time. Morton will join us at a later stream. So uh, that should be cool. Let's just double check it. I'm just gonna find the actual stream so I can see your questions as well. I should probably have the microphone near my face as well <laughs> to make it a little bit easier. All right, just waiting for people to show up. Hello, hello again. <laughs> yeah, so Martin will join me later on. I'm just uh, going to just set up, uh, just gonna share this to our social media so people can actually see the stream. And then I'm going to start this. I'm going to start a creature this time. This is gonna be more con uh, creature concepting, which is gonna be a lot of fun. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yes, just feel free to shoot your questions in the um, in the description uh, in the in the message box, <laughs> the comment field message box in the comment field, and I'll get to that. Just give me one second. Gotta message the Flip Momos Discord as well, and people know. All right, cool. So that means I can now get started with um, with your questions and with streaming and sc doing the sculpting. So today we're gonna be doing something a little bit, which is a bit different. We have. Um, we have the Flip Normals Creature Kit, and it comes with a bunch of different busts. For those of you who don't know, uh, the, the Creature Kit is a series of really high quality VDM brushes, which you can use to create really nice characters and creatures in no time. So I'm just gonna play around with this. It's a series of brushes that you can use to just create cool stuff right away. So to be honest, I don't know where we're going with this. I'm just gonna experiment with this, and just really just see where, where we go. So I'm just gonna increase, make it into Dynamesh. This will have some more resolution to play with. And then we are just going to have a look at that. So if people are interested in um, in the Creature Kit, I'm just gonna send a link in the description. The Creature Kit looks like uh, this. And it's, it's a really, really good design kit for, for general creatures. All these guys, they're made within like an hour, hour and a half or so. Uh, which is just solid for uh, for making creatures. So 50% off during the Black Friday sale. So just experimenting with an overall design. Maybe this guy is gonna have horns, maybe he's not. <laughs> Let's just see where we end up with this guy. It's a lot harder when Morton isn't here because I can't really do, uh, I can't really do uh, sculpting by myself. Oh, I can't really do questions and sculpting at the same time, <laughs> so I just have to take the break. Yeah, Morton is going to be—he's going to be sculpting later on today. We're going to be doing two streams today, because today is the Black Friday, and um, we're doing a bit of a special thing today. So I'm sculpting now, just a fresh new creature. And Morton's going to f continue his Mass Effect to do later on. So the cool thing is here—you can see that how quick it is to just come come up with some crazy ideas. Like I legit don't know where we're taking this guy now. Uh, we're just going to experiment and see where we can take him. So um, just starting off with, uh, if I hit, hit F key now, it, it, it's gonna filter all them very deliberately that we put this in here. So we have, for instance, uh, here, we're gonna have some, some cheekbones, I believe. We have some, a little cheekbone here. So we can just add this here. So we can just experiment with this and see where it takes us. The advantage of this is that um, it's, um, it's a much, much faster way of sculpting, just so that uh, 
we don't have to uh, we don't have to sculpt everything from scratch because honestly when you're designing you just want to get started with stuff you just want to get into the design uh blue hedge is asking how's morton doing yeah he's uh, he's doing fine uh, he just has a baby so he just had to take care of of uh of his uh his daughter right now so uh, he, he'll be joining us later on uh Pinak is saying, I got your iKid yesterday, amazing. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that's, a, that's a kit I use on everything as well. If you uh, if you uh, enjoyed it, uh, it would be cool if you could leave a review as well, or maybe like share your work as well. It would be really cool to see what you can do with that. What's your approach to texturing characters you know will be covered in fur? Great question. You. Uh, you need to separate into like what is going to be shown and what's not going to be shown. And if it's if stuff is going to be shown, then you really have to just texture that like there is no fur. This would be like the area around the eye. It would be uh, general like hands or fingers and that kind of stuff. And if it is going to be covered, then you uh, then you can use the textures to uh, to generate the fur color. Though you just it just depends on the hair system you're using as well. So figure out what the hair system is and test it out before you actually start to texture. Because it's going to be quite quite different. Your way of texturing for it might be quite different based on the actual uh, system you're using. So now we're just exper I'm just experimenting a bit with ears. I really like the goblin ear. It's one of these sculpting ears is really tricky. So uh, just by <laughs> already having uh, the the creature kit here, we can just drag it out and you can see what works. The advantage of this is that iteration becomes so much faster. Because it means you can you can do this, then you can just like move it over like so, then you can undo it, and you can try a different ear, and then you can just see what works. Particularly if you're doing client work, this is really useful because it it just means you can you can experiment with things. When it comes to designing, you really don't want to waste your time. I won't even say waste your time. Spend your time on the technical sculpting because you've already proven to yourself that you can sculpt if you actually get the job. So there's no reason to do. To do to spend the time on that, you just want to come up with designs really fast. So it, it's a really cool way of doing that. So I'm just going to make sure that the there is a bit of overlap or not overlap between the ears and the horns. This way, keep, keep it clean. So yeah, this this session here is going to be a bit more relaxing than the other ones we had, where Morton has been taking questions or like yesterday where I took questions. So it's going to be a bit more. Uh, Bit more informal like that well you know they're all quite informal just uh more it's gonna be more sculpting for me this time and less talking hopefully unless i'm talking about the sculpting so just trying to come up with different things like yeah we have an ear but uh maybe let's just try out different ears so uh with the smooth stronger brush i use smooth stronger a lot you can find this under light box and under brush and then you can find it under smooth and then just it may or may not be here yeah here it, here it is still because i just moved it into the default one so i just said b and ss and then it's going to be replacing the default one so let's try to drag an eye so you just double click it and then you can just get it here the cool thing is you can really experiment with this also a um, little announcement uh we've been we're probably talking about this on social media but i'm working on a kit for similar to the creature kit just specifically for the the face like human faces so you can make human faces really fast so it's not ready to be shown off yet as an actual demo but it just focuses on more realistic human base measures eyes ears noses and all that without going into the creature what's the what plugin is he using? So I'm not really using a plugin, uh, but I am using a product called, uh, let's see if I where I put it. I'm using a product called the Flipmomos uh, Creature Kit, which you can find here. So it's just a series of, of brushes that we sculpted. Well, not series of brushes, a series of VDM brushes specifically. So let's see here. We can use, the, I want the nose as one. Which I believe I copied all this over earlier. Fur, horns, mouth, nose. There we go. So it tons of noses as well. So it's it's really cool because you can uh, you can go in here and you can just experiment to be like, oh, pig nose. Let's see if that works. Because if you had to sculpt this, that would take like maybe like a few minutes at minimum just to, just to try it out and see if it actually works. And if it doesn't work, then you just waste a few minutes. But if you're like this and you're like, huh, you try this, or we can go bat nose and we can like, huh, let's see if it works. You just skull. And I can just truly experiment with this, which is, I'm loving this. I'm, I'm having so much fun with, with this kit. 
So if I wanted to sculpt something freestyle, then I'll, I'll just, you know, sculpt something completely from scratch from a sphere. But if I want to have fun with character design, then um, then we're, uh, then we're, I, I just use this kit. <laughs> yeah, Morton is saying he's stuck in traffic. Yeah, uh, Morton's going to join us in a separate stream later on. And hopefully I'm not going to have like cardiac arrest from uh, streaming too much today, which will be excellent. So let's try this one. We can try old sad. And then trying this out like so. Try wide smile. <laughs> Looks quite cool. We can see, uh, I'm not sure how creature like I'm going to go. I might go quite creaturey for this guy. Uh, let's just move this up a little bit, like so. Let's see what this looks like, so I can try like a bit more of an extreme mouth this time. Let's see, the mouth was here. Okay, I'm just, just gonna make this the mouth area larger, so I can fit <laughs> the mouth. Let's see the mouth. What's important when you're using the kit is that you have to turn off uh, symmetry. And because otherwise uh, it's gonna add too much to it. Let's see here. Not liking this, I think I'll go with something else. Mouth. Try with. Uh, let's try this one. I mean, I'll find something I like as well. But at least it means that I can just experiment with things. And then what you have to do as well with this one, it comes from the interface. You just have to use mirror and weld. Or you can also just use like mirror and then mirror and weld. Because you're not going to hit the center line perfectly with this. But that's fine. Easy peasy. I was just browsing the Flip Normal site to see if there was a human skin kit of a human face kit when you mentioned it's in the works. Yeah, so we have a we have one for skin already at least. So uh, for like it's called a Flip Normal's face kit, which is for human skin. It's basically like the the fa the creature kit or the sorry the uh, the skin kit for uh, for alphas for fa human faces, which is really cool. But um, for yeah for specifically creating VDM brushes for the face, we uh, we're working on that. No idea when that's out. It's like getting to an okay state right now. Now we just have to do some cleanup, add some additional ones, and then make a lot of really cool sculpts for marketing purposes as well. I can just play around with this, see what works. I also have a lot more different ones here as well, so we can just experiment with some of these. There are some cool abstract shapes as well. Some of these can look quite cool. Like it might be good to like break up the back of the head or something, or to give him some kind of shapes like this. Quite nice. You can also do it to break something up here. The cool thing about the layer abstract shapes is it allows you to just like get weird stuff. So uh, like this, like you often when you're designing, you just want to introduce some chaos into your models, and then you can fix this later on. It just means you can uh, you get like get to see patterns you wouldn't otherwise necessarily see. So just experimenting with this. Mario Morales is saying, I got Ben's course, face kit, anatomy bust, and some other anatomy references yesterday. Thanks all for the hard work. Awesome. Yeah, that, those are really solid resources, and I think you're going to have uh, a lot of fun with those. One thing that actually does help us a ton is if you do get some uh, some of our courses and, and you enjoy them is if you leave a review afterwards. You know, not like you leave an honest review. Uh, this really just helps people to, to get to know the different courses or different resources and such. Because it's really hard for people to know just from the images, but if there are resources, that helps just a ton. All right, this is one character. Let's see if we can try something else. The cool thing is that, like I said before, you can spend like a few minutes on one character and you can just see if it works or not. If it doesn't work, that's fine. How much can an already experienced ZBrush specialist earn? I don't think there is really such a thing as a ZBrush 
specialist. It's not like in other software where there might be like deep troubleshooting or like consulting as such for Cverse particularly. It's more for characters. Like you might be a, a character modeler or a general character artist, but don't think there was such a thing as a Cbrush specific one. Like you wouldn't, you might have a Photoshop specialist or something, but a Cbrush one, it's more like a, a character specialist. And character specialists can, can make a lot of money, but that depends entirely on, we've been talking about this throughout the stream now, throughout this week, but it depends so much on your location, depends obviously on your skill set, your portfolio, your, your resume, what company you're working for, if you're freelancing or if you're working for uh, for a company. Like it really, really, really just depends on, on all those factors. Just experimenting here, trying to use different, uh, different uh, tools than before or different uh, uh, VDM brushes than before. Yeah, like uh, Lars is saying, uh, Jotun, salary is also going to be hugely area dependent, like no, no doubt about that. Uh, the location is probably one of the biggest factors in your in your salary. Meaning that somebody who's like at like a um, like a junior salary in uh, in in New York or Los Angeles is going to make probably significantly more money than somebody who's at a senior salary in like uh, Bangalore or something like that. Like location, just the salary is just very completely by location. Just playing around with the ear. What you can do, you can like add one one element here at a time, refine it, move on to the next one, or you can do what I did before, where I just like basically just try them kind of vanilla and see what happens. With this as well, you can also experiment just with the the head shapes and just all that kind of stuff. So just to see where we end up with, like I have no idea where we're taking this guy, and that's that's really the cool thing about this is you can truly just experiment with this, and you can see how fast you can see you can get patterns in this as well. Let's see. You can also do fur. This is a, this is a, it's actually really cool. You can just add like quick fur to him as well, like this. And like this, this fur is pretty decent. I've been using this for a lot of various things. So you can just play around with this as well. That's obviously something you would do a bit later, but uh, just want to show that. All right, so he needs some kind of nose, which we just established was down here. For this, you do have to uh, disable symmetry for it. And here you can see that it's uh, uh, the stuff gets very jagged, and that's because of the uh, the surface underneath it. So I'm just gonna enable symmetry and just soften off all this. You can also just dynamize it as well. I'm using uh, Smooth Stronger for this, which is uh, a really really underrated brush. Yeah, here you can see what happens if you use symmetry with this. Uh, let's see if the pig nose is, is working or not. It may not, it may. Uh, we can try the monkey one. Try the bear one. It was really cool making this kit because I, I got to look at a lot of animals. So it's just looking like monkeys and bears for like a few months. <laughs> so really fun stuff. Uh, I just want to increase the resolution a bit. You want to be careful with increasing the resolution too much. Uh, I'm doing this now simply because the brushes require that. Okay, and then we'll go down here and we're just gonna pick the noses again. And we're gonna try the bear one. I like the bear one. After working with game artists for Flip Normals, do you think game art is more complex than CG for TV and film? No, I don't think it's more complex. I think I think both are insanely complex when you, when you start to get into it. And they have very different challenges. In uh, film, you're really trying to hit like a photorealistic mark, while in games you're trying to also hit that, but at the same time trying to make something run really fast as well. So very different challenges. Meaning, I don't think one is easier than the other. You also have different differences, in industries, and uh, like in terms of how the like how the the business model works for different companies, how long contracts are, all that. Basically, I really don't think one is easier 
or harder than the other. I think it just depends so much from company to company and project to project. All right, I definitely want something with horns, I think. Let's experiment with this. The cool thing is you, you, you just sculpt these kind of things once and you can just play around with it. Kind of like this, it's pretty wacky. And yeah, just make sure to remember to check out Flip Mobiles. 50% uh, off nearly all products. Uh, we have our Black Friday sale ongoing. And since today is Black Friday, we're really, <laughs> we're really eager to see. Uh, we really hope that people will check out the products there as well. Yeah, General Soundwaves asking, I'm really late to this. What is he using that is dropping an entire pre sculpted ear onto the Sea Sphere? Yeah, this is uh, the Flip Normals Creature Kit. It's just a series of, um, I'm posting the link in the in the description here in the comments. It's just a series of, uh, of uh, pre made VDM brushes. So it comes with an alpha as well, like this guy here took it was like no time at all you see the, the brushes the hair we had here this this came from the um, the fur brushes that we looked at later on okay i just want to change change this a little bit yeah so vdm brushes are incredible we also have we also have a lot of different vdm brushes on flip normals well it's not just a creature kit maybe it's cute with like a small one or something Or well, maybe we can make his entire face into like a horn. Let's try this. Let's try to make his entire face into a horn. That could be quite cool. For this, I definitely need to have a new tool like this and I need more resolution. I'm just gonna smooth this out. And then I need to disable symmetry for this as well. And then let's try to do something cool like this. Yeah, let's do this. Very Pacific Remy at this point, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's fine. Let's see. And someone is asking about uh, is there a mentorship course? Uh, yeah, I, I personally have a mentorship course. Uh, this is, uh, and uh, I post a link to this here so you can check that out. That we're, we're, that's where it's, it's all described, what it what's about and such. Yeah, Morton is saying, us. no, it's our kit, but it still amazes me how quick it is to concept about different characters. Yeah, I mean, same. Uh, this is a, I'm, I'm still amazed by how quickly you can block things out like that. Like how quickly you can just come out with concepts. Even like you could, of course, just snake cook this, but there's so much specificity in it. And like the barrier for, for actually doing uh, like something completely crazy is so much lower because like, obviously what I'm doing now is, is not like fantastic good concepting in the sense that it's pretty rough but like in a few minutes i've been able to just like play around with these ones uh, to the point that this is if you're working with a uh, if you're working in some kind of design environment it means you can play around with this and you can get these to this level really fast and you can just take it into photoshop paint over it or you can just continue to iterate on top of it it just means that you can get to to a design really 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 fast Uh, somebody's asking about a um, fundamental sculpting tutorial and oh boy do we have that let me show you a really 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 good fundamental sculpting tutorial also like this stream can be whatever you guys wanted to turn into if you if you guys want to have like really good uh, uh, product suggestions like if you're looking for some specific deals or something specifically you want to learn just just let me know and i'll, I'll be able to uh, to just find links to that here is uh, introduction to sculpting. It, it's gonna be in the link. It's gonna be in, in the comments a bit before I'm talking about it, just due, due to latency. But this is uh, intro to sculpting. This is a course which it's like 14 and a half hours. It focuses on really like 
kind of everything you need to know to get started with sculpting to like a, a high level. At the end, we sculpt this dwarf from scratch. This is a, uh, a course where we, we take him from start to finish, like first brush stroke, and it's all real time and everything. So no silly time lapses or anything like that. We cover a lot of various things here that's really important for sculpting. And we basically set out to make kind of like the ultimate course for sculpting. It's hard to, to really do that to get the ultimate course, but it's it's encompassing as much as we possibly can. We basically took as much as we could if, from what we currently know and put it into a course. Like uh, like I, I put everything I've, I I know about sculpting to a reasonable degree, put it in there. Morton and I discussed a lot back and forth, and then we we made it all into a proper course. So that was a ton of fun to do. And now I'm just gonna try out with the, the anatomy one. We have armor as well. So a lot of the cool stuff here as well, but I just want to play around with the anatomy one. Because I want the cheekbone one. So I want this, something like... Because the cool thing is you can just experiment with it. You can just kind of you're placing the eyes where you want the eyes to be now. And where should the eyes be? Don't really know. You can also just play around with the eyes. I think I might want more eyes for this one. Maybe this is some kind of kaiju guy. So we can try with the dragon brush. We can try like this. We can try like this. Let's try with that. And then we, of course, have to modify this so this fits into some kind of character thing. CGK is uh, saying, Intro to Sculpting is an amazing, amazing course. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, like I said, Morton and I, we really put a lot of heart and soul into, into building my course. It's, uh, I, I really, I, I really don't know a whole lot more <laughs> than what's in that course. The uh, what's in what's in that course is is focusing on basically most of the things I I know. Of course, I learned some more things since that course, and you can't take away the years of practice as well. But from a computer, uh, like it, it, we really put down everything there. But I want to make another course as well in the future at some point called like Introduction to Anatomy, just focusing on kind of like a continuation of that, where it's intro to sculpting is really general, where it focuses on a lot of abstract concepts like appeal and gesture and mid-frequency, basics versus fundamentals, all that. Basically, it gives you like a structured path for how you can how you can learn. But intro to anatomy would be more specific. Let's try this. Let's see if we can put a shark mouth in this guy. We can. <laughs> that looks better. So what you can see here as well, this little tip for you. You see I have activate symmetry down here, and if I hover over it, I have shift and X. Just a little tip for you, that it's probably a good idea to do something like that. The reason is that uh, you see the X key is very close to the Alt key. It's very close, it's right above it. So it's very easy to accidentally hit the X key when you're when you're working, and then you disable symmetry, and then you're just in the world of trouble, because now you have to fix your symmetry later on. That's so annoying. I also have a mirror here, so I can like, if I, if I were to do something, I can like mirror it around, or I can just mirror and weld as well. Then when, when it comes to the uh, the mouth, you have to think about this in terms of a skeleton. Like now, right now, I'm really just like playing around with the shapes and all that, but once you get into it, you have to, once you get think more about it, you have to think about specifically how does the jaw like articulate? Uh, how does the top jaw go in and, and how does this whole thing actually work? Because otherwise you won't be able to move it around. For what I'm doing now, way, way less of a concern than making it look cool. <laughs> I'm really, I really just want to make this thing here to look cool right now. And let's see if we can make that happen. Maybe I can't. That's also a very real possibility that this thing is just going to look lame at the end. So, all right, maybe I can make some ears for this guy as well. Um, it's more of a kaiju kind of style character, but I have a little bit of an idea. My idea may be beyond terrible. <laughs> Let's see. Let's try some cat ears. That's absolutely terrible. Uh, let's see. I was thinking of something like this, maybe like maybe it's like gonna be like more aerodynamic or oh, aqua dynamic, whatever it's called when it's underwater. <laughs> so I was thinking something like this, and I can like push it backwards like this. Who knows how these kind of kaiju things are gonna work?
what I'm also trying to avoid, I'm trying to avoid basically this kind of like Pac-Man feeling, meaning that I'm trying to, like currently it looks like if it were to take this and make this go straight over, it looks like it kind of articulates from here. So I have to make sure that he articulates from a more sensible spot. I also want to work a bit more in the back of the head as well. Just thinking about how I can do that. It's really hard to design on the fly, but it's also a lot of fun. For all fit moments courses I do, whenever I'm designing anything, I've already sculpted the thing beforehand, just because it's it's so tricky to design something on the fly. And for a stream, it's fine because now we're just playing around and just you know answering questions and such. But for uh, an actual tutorial, you you can't really like waste somebody's time who spent good money on a proper course. So if it's a design course, obviously you need to actually design something on a fly. But for like a pure sculpting course, we uh, I, I nearly always have uh, have the sculpt done beforehand. This is also why it looks way easier to sculpt the in the course than it actually is for me, because this is the second time and I have like pretty good reference for it. What is the real life ref for this uh, creature? I have absolutely no reference for this. Uh, like uh, Ian is saying, I'm just jamming. Basically, like he's just exploring. It's a good idea to have reference for things, of course. We talk about this all the time that you need some kind of ref, but um, basically there's also an argument to just just playing around. Just like seeing what you come up with, and then from there you can uh, you can start with reference and and like solidify it. But just like doing something creative like this and just playing around, there's a lot of value in that as well. Yeah, so I'm, I'm very much subconsciously inspired by uh, by Knife Head from uh, Pacific Rim. I, I really, really, really enjoyed the the kaiju's from Pacific Rim one. That was like the the coolest thing. Like <laughs> I was watching it when it came out, like 2013 in the cinemas, and at some point I was just like involuntarily clapping in the cinema. <laughs> I just thought it was so cool. So just trying to make it a bit more gestural, like pushing this a bit further back as well. And again, you can see the advantage of having something like the, the creature kit. A lot of this now comes directly from the creature kit in the sense of like the base mesh, the, the dagger thing here, the uh, the overall, uh, the ear, the weird cat ear, the eye, the mouth, all of it just comes from there. Of course, you could sculpt this fairly easily without this kind of ref, but um, or without these, these kind of VDM brushes, but it just made it a lot easier. Again, the advantage of something like pre-made VDM brushes is not necessarily that you can that, that you can sculpt something you can never sculpt, meaning that I can sculpt this kind of stuff fine. It's more the fact that you can just experiment so quickly with it. That That is like a, there's a real, real value in that. Also because you we're very pattern seeking uh, animals <laughs> and we just tend to uh, we just tend to uh, go for the same patterns over and over and over again and having some brushes like this can really break it down or can break up the the patterns we, we keep seeing. If I were to continue this guy, like you know, maybe I will, but uh, more than just like a stream, if this was for production and such, it would be like figure out something like this that looks really cool, and then I would try to find animals or creatures that would would look similar to what this guy looks like in terms of uh, like anatomy. I have no idea what that would be, but maybe for this it would actually be like a knife <laughs> or something. Just I have some cool reference there, and for. Uh, and for the, the eyes, so we'll try to find an animal that's similar, just so you have some real reference. Also, like in terms of a production, you need some kind of real world reference because uh, otherwise it's really hard to uh, to have discussions about it. Then the feedback notes are just gonna be all over the place. But if you have a common reference, then at least it becomes much easier. What I'm trying to do now is I'm trying to make everything a bit more cohesive in terms of uh, making sure that everything just fits a little bit more together. Uh, Sudhir is asking, no Morton today. Yes, there will be Morton today, just not uh, right now. <laughs> uh, 
there's a temporary Morton shortage in Denmark and uh, that shortage will be rectified in a few hours. Uh, I'm going to do this stream entirely by myself, but uh, Morton is going to join in a second stream later on because we're doing a lot of streaming today. Uh, randomly doodles is asking do you think it's best to learn to model something yourself and then use vdms for the same thing after almost like a reward uh, yeah you, the thing is you need to you need to learn how to model not necessarily like this kind of design from scratch but you need to be able to to sculpt things from scratch meaning that if you if you rely on vdm brushes then what if you're being asked to model something and you don't have vdm brushes then you're in trouble so uh, i highly recommend that you that you learn the fundamentals of it you learn what an eye looks like you learn the basics of anatomy essentially this is a shortcut and use shortcuts and if you uh, once you know the real path to go somewhere because uh, so often you just need to do it like the real way as well yeah somebody's saying i see a sawfish with a sheep head yeah excellent that's that's a good way of looking at it like that that could that could be a good way to get proper reference for this for sure what about uh how to switch from blender to maya it's not a, it's not inherently a bad idea it's more like i'm not sure if people would be interested in that because most people tend to do the opposite most people have been have been switching to uh, to blender these days so there just haven't been that many people actually going the other way just trying to find my reference here because i had a little bit of a prf just before i started so if if people are interested in that that'd be cool but uh, currently i don't think there's a big market in, in in that to be perfectly honest so now i found a reference of like uh, of like a kaiju so i'm just gonna see what i can do with that Gonna try to make his neck a lot thicker if you want to make something feel really like really strong i really recommend just making the neck feel really 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 powerful and i'm using smooth stronger quite a lot now just because it's really good for simplifying down the creature or simplifying down the shapes like down here we have a lot of uh, general like brush strokes and such and which might help to inform some general decisions but uh, or like you might see patterns this way but uh it's it's a good idea to to just be in control of the shapes. And there was a question yesterday actually, which we didn't get to, which was, is it a good idea to to smooth after every single stroke, or is it a best a good idea not to? I recommend, particularly if you're new to sculpting, that you don't use a smooth brush at all. Actually, just try to do it as a challenge, just with the uh, the clay builder brush, because this is going to force you to really have st strong brush control. And then you can go in and you can uh, you can you can of course introduce the smooth brush and such because it's it's very easy to use that as a crutch so that you're always trying to just uh, use the the smooth brush you sculpt smooth sculpt smooth though it's not objectively bad to do it right like it's uh, many really really strong artists are doing that so it, it's all it's all just what you whatever you prefer but I definitely recommend playing around with not using smoothing at all like I can sculpt the whole a whole creature basically no matter what it is only with uh clay billup somebody's saying get a tongue in there that is not a bad idea we're gonna add a sphere to it and then we're gonna put this guy here and i think we might have a tongue mesh see yeah we have a tongue mesh of course we do so let's try this one. Let's try generic. Oh, we need a lot more resolution for this. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty large tongue. So we can just put this guy in here. I'm just going to go in and uh, carve in this a little bit. Just carve it in like so. Hello, is there a way to determine scale in ZBrush? Not really. The way you determine scale in ZBrush is another software and then you import something into it. So if you want to have a highly specific scale, that is something we did for the latest course I was working on. We, uh, we start in a blender, just add a cube, which is a specific scale. Maybe the head is like, you know the head is gonna be 40 centimeters. Then you, you just stick to 40 centimeters. And then from there, you are, you're, uh, you're, you're, you keep working with that. 
but yeah, there isn't really like a uh, inherently a, a scale in ZBrush. So let's move this guy. In. So here you can again see a, an, an advantage of this. Like you can really quickly just play around with this. Oh, you need a tongue. Just chuck a tongue in there. Easy. Also, make sure to work with perspective enabled. Otherwise, it's gonna be this gonna look wrong. Some people sculpt the north of you. That might be fine for details and such. The big, big problem with sculpting the north of you is the fact that you're never gonna render in north of you, and that means the character is gonna look a little different. So, like, imagine you're you're sculpting like sculpting like this, then you put it into shot, and now it's like this. It's just not gonna fit whatsoever. So it's really important to to check uh, the uh, to check the uh, the model in uh, perspective view a lot and and also like Seavers is a bit weird when it comes to the camera and lights and everything so I highly recommend in general to um, to check your model in something like Blender or Maya like throughout just because it's you just won't really know what the whole thing looks like same with the matte cap as well like the matte cap I'm using now is really nice it's not a matte cap actually it's just a material it's just a basic material so I can change the lighting for this and this is really solid because it means that I can I can play around the lighting but you really want to make sure to avoid matte caps like this because this exaggerates everything so now you can see here there are brush strokes here but if I change this back to this one they become a lot less prominent I just smooth them out now but like in general <laughs> they're um, it's harder to see the details, which means that you're going to go less hard on them in ZBrush, and now you can't see them at all in the other software. Now, Wynn is saying, your channel helped me a lot about technique. Thank you so much. Uh, that's awesome to hear. I'm trying to make this a bit like more daggery now, so I'm trying to change the, basically like the, the silhouette, if you already cut off you, more like this instead of like this trying to make it a bit like stronger Trying to make some kind of cool shape up here as well. Yeah, Mike is saying that Seabrush is a pretty big problem with enhancing details. Even the basic material, everything is so much more crisp than proper renders. So yeah, no, for sure, it's it's just an it's just an issue in general. So um, it's uh, it's it's just a problem. You just need to take your model out of Seabrush and uh, take it into uh, into a proper render engine. Like, ZBrush is not a proper render engine whatsoever, so you have to preview it once in a while. Just playing around with some anatomy here. Well, not even anatomy, just some weird shapes. Just seeing what works or not. Uh, I had some cat ears, don't like them whatsoever. Uh, so I'm just gonna cut them off. The way you can do that is you can hold down Control, Shift, and right mouse button, like so. And then you can go to uh, uh, select knife wrecked, like so. You can just cut stuff off, like so. My god, this works with symmetry now. This never used to work with symmetry. I was going to show you the mirror trick. But yeah, cool, awesome. I did not know that. Fantastic. Cool, so uh, pro tip, the uh, the knife brushes now work with symmetry. <laughs> the marina. Always some like weird little updates in ZBrush. Oh, somebody's saying that if it's uh, if uh, if I sculpt something behind the like my faces in a way, so <laughs> just gotta make sure to sculpt something up here. Tips for nailing down likeness. Yes. So let's talk about that real quick. Quick lecture. Uh, when when you when you need to sculpt something, there are two parts to it. Part one and part two and part one is when you are trying to make something feel like a natural looking character this is like anatomy this is where you you need to feel grounded no matter what what, what it is you're doing 
this just have to be solid. You need the bones to be in the right spot, the muscles to be in the correct spot. It doesn't matter if, if all the shapes are kinda in the right spot based on likeness, if the anatomy is not there. So anatomy will have to be there. So of course we can try likeness right away, but likeness is uniquely hard because the anatomy will have to be hard. And then step two is design. And design in this case means getting specific shapes in a highly specific spot. And that's the tricky thing with likeness, that now you have to get the likeness of the specific person. Legit, really hard to do. The tricky thing with this if you is gathering, gathering reference. If you were to have a perfect reference, meaning like a scan you can project it, easy peasy, then you just kind of project the thing on top and it's fine. The problem is you have to find reference and the reference you're finding is not going to be good. You're going to have, most likely going to have actors that probably have some makeup on. There are, uh, uh, they're going to look different in different, um, different shots because there are different ages, different focal lengths of the camera. And there's no way you're ever going to know what focal length they're using because that stuff is not public. Like why would uh, some kind of uh, celebrity paparazzi publish what focal length they're using? You, you just don't basically know anything about the, the camera you're using. So it's really, really hard. Uh, some tips for it is to line cameras up in uh, Maya or Blender and then like try to just, just like look through the cameras uh, and then like just just be very, very attentive to details. You have to line them up. You cannot, if you're doing line, you, can't, you cannot in any way just kind of look at your reference and then uh, and then try to sculpt it. You need to line it up. And this is one of the tedious things about it, that you need to actually line things up because the tiniest detail, or tiniest change of proportion detail can make it look different. Yeah, what uh, some of you are saying, like Chris Costa has a really great workflow. So he exports work in progress, but displays maps and check them in Maya. We'll sculpt and see where he needs that detail. This is exactly what I'm doing as well. And you kind of have to do that. Like I, I take my sculpts into ZBrush way earlier than that or into Blender Maya as well, way earlier than that as well. Uh, I, I do it like in work in progress stages just so I can test, test it out. But particularly if you're doing like uh, details and like final sculpt of things, you need to do this. Let me show you a good example of this as well. Let me find it here. So for uh, a course I was just doing called uh, Realistic Character Portrait Masterclass. <laughs> Realistic Character Portrait Masterclass, bit of a mouthful. So specifically, uh, I was sculpting this character here. And uh, the difference between this shot and this shot is like six hours of sculpting or five hours of sculpting or something. You don't see it here, but if you look at the close-ups, you're definitely going to see it. But one of the things you see is like you have this, you have some like um, some veins here and such. And this is added here because I took it into the render. And in one of the renders, let's see if I can find it here. In one of the renders, it was looking really flat. And then it was like, well, I need to break this up. And you only get this feedback once you put it into shot. It's really, really hard to, to get this feedback if you haven't put your character into shot. So absolutely put your character into shot as early as possible. Because this also means, for instance, I know this is a final camera angle. That means that the screen right side of the character, like here, the equivalent side of this is irrelevant. So <laughs> we don't care about that. It means that uh, anything that's not being visible, we really don't have to enhance any further. Of course, everything will need to be at a solid level, but it means that like this region here becomes less important just because at this point we have the final lighting. So if I'm, I keep refining this guy, we need to do things where it's actually gonna be seen. Now, obviously, your character will have to be fully three-dimensional and it will need to work and all that uh, just in general but it just means that you can you can be a bit more selective where you put in the work basically you have a finite amount of resources in this case time to do your project you need to put them in the right spot here's a, a few little tips as well actually based on this guy just for pure sculpting and um, add these tiny little pores tiny little pores when you're done which like pimples and pores and such and that's going to add a lot of uh, realism to your work what i did as well for this course is that in the seabrush i painted a uh, poly painter mask very similar to what i'm doing now actually just you know with the not with pink but i painted with with white or i made a whole thing white and i painted with black just so i can mark them then i exported this uh, map out here to painter and then i continued to refine them in painter or rather i used them as a mask for a fill layer in painter and this allowed me to um, to get let's see if i have a texture map here 
Uh, let's see here. It allowed me to get these ones, and that's what you can see. These are uh, this is just a mask from uh, from ZBrush to sculpt on top, and it really just adds a lot of it. And this means that these ones here are perfectly correlated with the um, the actual uh, details in uh, in ZBrush. So it means that they're just going to have a lot more dimensionality to it. The second tip I want to talk about here is the fact that when it comes to sculpting like a character like this, try to sculpt it as closely as it would be in real life. Obviously, this is more of a fantasy character, but if this was a human, like notice like the ears and such, try to make them thin. Try to make all this as volumetric as you can. For instance, if you were to make the ears impossibly thick, which is a really big beginner mistake, like you just make them and go in like so. Big problem with that is that the subsurface is gonna be crazy and you're gonna to have to overcompensate for that in subsurface. Also, I'm just going to leave a link to this in the description as well, uh, or in the chat. This is this is course as well. It's also 21 hours long, and it covers everything on how to make this course from scratch. But yeah, uh, I'm talking a bit more about this course specifically, just because of um, like it's so fresh and there's a lot of knowledge in. Like I have a lot of knowledge based on this course. So if you guys have questions about characters like this, feel free to just uh, just ask. Or if you have any questions about any specific courses, and remember that all like, all the courses, all the Flip Moments exclusives are fifty percent off during Black Friday. The sale lasts until Tuesday, and um, yeah, make sure to grab your uh, some if you've been eyeing some a course, a resource, or anything like that. Is it possible to just use ZBrush or Blender to sculpt, or do we need ZBrush? You don't need ZBrush. Blender can handle a lot of things. It depends what you're using it for. If you're if you're sculpting once in a while or you're sculpting like smaller projects, Blender is going to be totally fine. But if you are working with anything like, uh, I would say like off of a bigger scope or in a collaborative team sense, I really recommend using ZBrush. It's also a case that if you're actually working on a team, you you can't just send people like your blend file. You could of course send an OBJ, but it, it's just annoying to have to convert files back and forth. I highly recommend if you work professionally that you're working with um, that you're working with the same tools as people are working with. Because the the problem is, let's say you're working in Blender, you have to export an OBJ to ZBrush. They start to work with layers and morph targets and polypainting all that, and now you want to work further on it. Now they can't just send you a C tool. They're gonna have to you're gonna have to export all that out, and it's a huge mess. And what if they want to get the file back in a little bit later on. So uh, the sculpting feel in ZBrush is also superior to Blender. Like, I, I mean, I think that's a fairly objective thing. It's not actually my opinion per se. I think it's actually like a, you can get better shapes in Blender or in ZBrush than you can in Blender. The tools are just much more refined. But it also makes sense. Like, Blender is not a worse software than ZBrush. It's just not a dedicated sculpting software like it would be insane if a, a software like blender that's really has not had a proper focus on sculpting would be would be something like zbrush that's been had a focus on sculpting for 20 years is today the last um last live stream it is not we're gonna keep sculpting over a little bit over the weekend and then monday and uh, then tuesday as well Unless Mort and I burn out to a crisp, which may may happen. <laughs> it's called, uh, streaming is quite intense. It's really fun, but it's also really draining as well. Have you guys thought about doing a videos about salaries in industry? Yeah, that would be really cool to do. It's a pretty elaborate video to do, and you also have to get salary data from people and all that, but that would be a really interesting video to do. I would really like to do that. Just, just a big, big project to do. So uh, we've been talking a little bit about this throughout the stream this week, but uh, you probably noticed that we haven't been as active over the last like year, two years as we, we've been before, like from like 2018 onwards. And the reason for that is, is very simple. We, we've been rebuilding the website and we are what they kindly refer to as development hell at the moment. It's been, it's been really intense in terms of development in the site. We're not developers ourselves, so we've been outsourcing that while well, hiring hired a team to do that for us. And uh, it's just a massive, massive job for us. So uh, hopefully that, that launches early next year, late this year, you know, not uh, much left of the year. And then we're gonna have a really cool website, which is we are very excited about. Uh, and end, end of the day, what this means for you guys is just that we're gonna be able to produce a lot more content, more live streams, more cool products, all that kind of stuff. So uh, 
I think it's gonna be cool. I'm very excited to be able to like give back a lot more to the industry in terms of um, like just sharing what we know and helping people uh, achieve their goals. I suppose it's really something I want to I want to help more with. What are the forms you can't do in Blender? It's if you get to a high poly count, it gets uh, Blender slows down as well. But it it's more like the specific the specificity of the brushes you have in ZBrush. The brushes you have in ZBrush are just really really solid. So it's like the clarity of the forms, the sharpness of the forms, how easy it is to get there. Obviously, you can ultimately get to the same point or same level in both software in if you had infinite in one time because it's just points in space but you don't have an infinite in one time so most likely it's going to blend a seabrush is going to be a much better sculpting software for you though the key thing here is that seabrush is significantly harder to learn than blender uh blender is blender is is very very easy to learn for sculpting it's it's like a few minutes and you kind of get up to speed on the sculpting tools while seabrush is a lot more cumbersome so actually speaking of that we can talk a bit about um we made some courses recently, maybe not recently. Time has been weird during COVID, so it's hard to know when anything came out. But here, for instance, we have a tool, we have a product called Introduction to Sculpting in Blender. And um, this is where um, you learn basically how to sculpt in Blender. Like, it's still a great sculpting tool, don't get me wrong. And you learn how to sculpt this guy from scratch <laughs> at the end, which is cool. So we cover basically a lot of the same things as Intro to Sculpting, just uh, more beginner focused, more technically Blender focused. 50% off during Black Friday as well. So um, Blender, absolutely great tool for sculpting. It's just that Seabrush is just a more refined product. Cool, let's give this guy some teeth. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to duplicate this guy. And then I'm going to use a video brush down here. And this is called teeth. The reason I'm, use, I'm duplicating it is so that I can actually add teeth to it. Like so, let's see. Mm, let's see here. We actually have an IMM brush instead of a VDM brush. This is what I'm looking for. So I want to play around with this. This only works if you don't have um, if you don't have um, subdivisions. But this is really cool. You can see how quickly you can block these out. And these are like these are like decently topologized. Nah, they're not. Uh, they're auto retopologized. Never mind. Uh, but they have a really nice shape to them. So you can you can use this to like really quickly block in where you want the teeth to be. So like I'm I'm really liking this kit. I use this kit a lot. Uh, like if I need to create cool cool creatures really fast, I use this kit a lot for that. So I'm gonna get back to your questions in a second. I just have to concentrate a sec when I'm doing this. What I'm trying to do as well is I'm trying to make the the teeth have have a different size to them. Let's see here, and of course we can alter these later on as well. And what you also have to think about is, can he close his mouth? <laughs> that may not be possible with this. Not a huge concern in terms of pure functionality at this point. So already you can see how much scarier he looks just because he has teeth now. <laughs> it's really important to do that. All right, cool. I'm pretty happy with how this is looking. And then what I want to do is I want to actually just hide. I want to hide everything but this. Let's see. Hide this, hide this, make sure there's nothing else, and then delete hidden. And I have delete hidden right... Where is delete hidden? Here's delete hidden. That means that I now have teeth. Cannot spell today, but that will just be a problem for people who want to read this. And now we have teeth. So really nice and easy. Yeah, what Mike is saying here is, is put on in chat as well. Like the industry doesn't care, really care about the tool cost. Uh, my cost one twentieth of the price of a single junior artist salary. Yeah, this is a this is an interesting one. This is something we've been talking about beforehand as well on uh, like in some of our videos as well that the cost of an artist 
or the to cost of a tool is not immediately apparent. What I mean by that is, let's say Maya is $3,000 a year. I don't know the exact price of it, but I think it's something like that. And then Blender is free. That means that Maya is now more expensive. Obviously, Maya is more expensive. The direct cost of the, of the tool is a lot more. But this is not nowhere near the, the actual truth. Because if you want to, uh, if you want to look at the whole cost of, of this, if you want to look at the big picture, you have to look at okay, do people know how to use Blender? Okay, people don't know how to use Blender, so we have to retrain them. How okay, how how much does it cost to retrain them? Like, well, we need teachers, we need staff for that. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's let them. That's one cost. Okay, they're going to learn Blender, then they have to. They're going to be less productive for some time. Like, there's no way that they're not going to be, that they're not going to be less productive. That's just how it works. You learn new software, and you're going to be much less productive for a few months. So then there's a loss of productivity, which means lost products or lost projects. And then you have um, the fact that okay, but we already have the pipeline set up for uh, for Maya. So what what is the cost to rebuild all the tools? And the tools we have are they're tested, meaning they work. So and they've been tested over 20 years. So the code might be old, but they still work. It means it's a big factory and the tools have been tested. So now you have to rebuild all of that. So right there, you have to hire a software engineer or like you need to have a lot of people hired for that. And they're expensive, very, very expensive to hire. And what if something goes wrong? Well, now you waste a lot of time and you have to redo it. So overall, it's just very expensive. And then the biggest thing is, does it add anything to our to our production? When we, if we were to switch to a free tool, quote unquote free tool, will we be able to produce more content than before? In a case of uh, Blender versus Maya, like th there is nothing new in Blender that you can't do in Maya. Like it might, it's rather the opposite in terms of a pure production tool. Maya is, is a far more refined tool. There are some things you can do only in Blender, sure. Like Grease Pencil is obviously a much better tool than what you have, the equivalent you have in Maya. But then just add that to your production. Don't change the whole thing out. Basically, the cost of a tool is not immediately obvious. So if somebody is just like, oh, you should switch to Blender because it's free. No, it, it's really, 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 really not free. It, it has no cost to get the software, <laughs> but that does not mean that is free. And just the fact that stuff has been tested in Maya, it means that if you if you switch to Blender, you have this whole like mystery thing that you generally don't know if something is gonna work or not until you properly tested it. Let's say you have an animation, and you want to export out the animation to render in Houdini or something. Then you in, in Maya that the tools are developed, you click a button and the animation is, is cached out in Alembic or USD or whatever you're using these days. And then you can now just pick it up. But in Blender, this may not work. Maybe it does, but you haven't tested it. And then, so you have to test every single thing over and over and over again. And if it doesn't work, you have to build custom tools or you could just stick to what you have. But yeah, like uh, Mike is saying as well, like for people who don't know, Mike is a, a senior look dev artist right now, I think you are. Uh, comes from a groom background, made an introduction to Action for us as well. <laughs> Great course. Uh, so uh, he knows what, what he's talking about. But yeah, people, we were definitely switching tools. Like the industry is switching tools all the time. Like Painter is being, uh, is added fast. Houdini is being added fast. Uh, and Houdini is also taking over a lot of Maya tasks, uh, like uh, a lot of lighting tasks and all that kind of stuff. But uh, it's all where it makes sense to do it. Live stream tomorrow? Yeah, probably. I think we're gonna live stream tomorrow. So you can just see how fast it is to actually like block something out like this with a teeth as well, just because we had we had this and we had a tongue as well. So now we can just play around with this a little bit. Just go in here. But yeah, basically like the whole like cost discussion, end of the day, it just, the, the, my main point is just that cost is a much much bigger thing than purely like money in money out it's uh, or like specifically what does it cost in terms of acquiring the license itself yeah houdini is being uh, 
is being used a lot these days and it's being used more and more and more like if i was still in production i would have been i would have been learning houdini as fast as i could right now uh, i've not really seen a houdini artist who's been unemployed <laughs> that tends to not really happen i see it's, it's a very versatile tool so uh a lot of people are replacing uh, like a lot of very heavy tools with houdini uh, animation rigging still very much being done in in maya modeling can really kind of be done anywhere but um houdini is taking over a lot of things like obviously effects it's not really taking over effects like it's just what you use for effects these days i know back in the day the, the different studios they had their own custom tools for that but most of that is just being taken over but it's also being used for for grooming as well like it's really it's really solid at grooming. If I were to learn Houdini, it would probably be for grooming because I'm very dissatisfied with the grooming <laughs> workflow in general in the industry. I think I think that would, the overall groom and the grooming tools just need to be overhauled, and I just don't think they're good at all. So, but I heard very good things about Houdini. How and at what point of the character process should I make the inside of the mouth? For, especially for creatures, not humans that are pre-made. So for this, I'm thinking about it pretty early because this character here is gonna move open his mouth quite a lot. So in that case, it's really important that he can actually open his mouth. So I'm like early, early on, if people were here early in the stream, you saw like I was thinking, talking about how he would articulate his mouth. It's really important to think about this. Like specifically, what does the mouth look like in this case? And also you can see I have some muscles as well here. Like you can see here, I have some, some muscles here, like going up and all that. So I'm thinking about this very early on in terms of a design. Just because it's a massive part of it. But before before you, you know, not the earliest thing, before you do that, make sure that the overall design is working. Yeah, Mike is saying groom tools are a nightmare. And and they just I think they just are a nightmare. Like for me, they're either they're either too simple, like the tools in uh, Blender 3.3, where you just can't really do everything you want to, or they're they're really heavy to use, or like they're really tricky to use. Uh, in terms of like X-Gen, we have to be so specific about it. What I find to be annoying with Groom Tools is it feels like the equivalent of doing poly modeling or like doing characters with poly modeling instead of doing characters with sculpting. Uh, like I just don't see the tools as like modern tools. So I would love to see like an actual modern tool where you can play around with that. Like fundamentally they're, they're like um, uh, GPU based and simulation based. Basically my idea for tool, which would be cool, is this doesn't exist. This is my pitch. <laughs> so you you basically you go with a paintbrush and the paintbrush will just quickly go over a various area. Like, so let's say you want to give this guy hair right here. You, you shouldn't go and set up a density map or whatever. You just go, you just click this tool and you just paint where you want to go. And you're like, this is now where the hair follicles will come from. And then zoop, these are just gonna appear out of nowhere. Like the, the hair is just gonna like go zoop, and now you have hair just in this area. And now you can interactively control the, um, the density of this, just basically with a slider, just control density. You can use traditional hair tools, like uh, like not grooming tools in CG, but like hairdressing tools, fundamentally turning it into a hairdresser where you're like, you have a, um, you have a comb, you can just go over here, you have a, a hair dryer, you have all sorts of cool different things. And then you can have a, a, like scissors and such. You can just like cut stuff off cut stuff here you're like okay cool we want to do this and then you can simulate it you can basically have some kind of some kind of hand brush which was just simulate a hand you can just take it around and just play around with that and and just make it easy i don't understand why hair fundamentally can't be easy to work with hair is so instrumental to essentially all characters even if you don't have a whole lot of hair at the moment then uh, it's still instrumental in terms of like just little stubbles and facial hair and all sorts of things so that's my pitch for a hair tool basically due to hair what marvelous designer did to clothes where it made it more fundamental in the sense that in marvelous you're not really a 3d artist you're a tailor in seabrush you're not a 3d artist you're a sculptor uh, same thing as well but if you're a, if you're working with uh, hair tools you're a technician <laughs> you shouldn't have to be a technician you should be a hairdresser 
and I've heard people say against this this argument here that oh, but now you have to become a hairdresser. No, but you still have to be a hairdresser. You still have to know the fundamentals of of hair. It would just remove a lot of the technicalities. That was my little rant about hair. Absolute nightmare to work with. So I'm just going to experiment a bit with the anatomy here. Just like playing around a bit with it. Making it a little bit wackier than just pure human anatomy. I'm curious if they're working more on hair tools in, in Maya. Like, Xgen really has not been updated in a very long time. So, but I'm curious if they're actually working on something there, or if that is just like a, a thing that's just not being developed anymore. If, if hair is just dead in Maya. Because it, it's a real shame, because hair is, is such an important thing. You, like, basically every single character will require some kind of groom. So just a reminder that we have 50% off on uh, all of Norman's exclusive courses. Let's talk about the skin kit. Skin kit is currently the most popular product on the entire marketplace. This is made by Damien, fantastic artist. Uh, this is where you can just very quickly just drag and drop alphas onto your character and you just get really, really, really high quality alphas right away. I'm trying to find some of the examples of the alphas. Yeah, here we are. So these are some of the alphas we have like the uh, the actual, we actually have skin, we have like lips, we have tons of various cracked brushes, all that kind of stuff. Uh, really, really solid kit. This is all like sculpted in the ZBrush, so this works really well. So just a little reminder that uh, that is currently 50% off. Back to our little Kaiju sculpt. Trying to add a bit of directionality to him. This is where I'm going a little bit away from like just conventional human anatomy. It's still you know, fundamentally based around human anatomy. I'm just, just playing around with some shapes here. Roughly speaking, how long would it take to go from Blender to Maya? I assume you mean in terms of learning the tools. I mean, they're pretty similar tools, like in a terms of, in terms of like, they're, they're both fairly general 3D tools. Like there's nothing too difficult about Blender or Maya, like in an absolute sense. It's not like you have to relearn a whole lot of concepts. Uh, there are, the interface is different, the hotkeys are different and such, but really the, the concepts are exactly the same. It's not like you're going to like Houdini, which is like node based, and that's a whole. Well, Maya is node based, but it's um, it's not like it's a procedural modeling setup or something like that. It's so it's it's kind of straightforward if you if you're if you know how to if you know Blender. I do recommend like we have a course called Introduction to Maya. So if you're interested in learning Maya, I highly highly recommend Intro to uh, Maya. Just really gets you up to speed on all that. It's not per se a, or specifically speaking, a switching from Blender course, but for all intents and purposes, it kind of is. <laughs> it just goes through how to learn, how you can learn Maya. And does a new Ben Aird course uh, cover hard surface sculpting? Uh, yeah, yeah, does uh, he sculpts a lot of stuff in hard surface or in with dynamation and such, and he he covers how to do how to do that. So he he does clean up a fair bit later on. In either he uses dynamesh or he uses uh, uh, blender and uh, motor for that, just to create like nice clean high poly or yeah, high polys for that. But he uses a lot of uh, dynamesh for sure. 
So it's very sculpting heavy course when it comes to hard surface. What's interesting about that is that I always assume that when you're watching somebody like a, like a master like Ben work when that they have these like insane secret techniques and absolutely there are techniques here you have to learn of course but in reality it's a series of methodical steps just taking one after another with uh, where, where they know how the tools work you can really do a lot of things just with like very standard brushes yeah here's actually a great great point from from Jengi. don't put stuff in your portfolio you don't want to do it's my new advice for myself yeah let's say let's say you start your career and, and you do um uh, the first thing you do is you've been put on sculpting rocks nothing wrong with sculpting rocks but maybe you hate sculpting rocks and now you have a whole portfolio filled with rock sculpting if you don't want to do any more of that just don't mention it just be like yeah that never <laughs> that never happened it just means that you can you can you, you can direct your career in a way you want to do it so if you want to um so let's say you want to do groom instead or you want to do look at or something instead instead of sculpting rocks then ask to be put on that internally and then do stuff like that in your spare time and just push for that as a general direction and then just don't mention that you know how to do rocks unless of course you really really need a job but essentially what it boils down to is take control of your career show in your portfolio what you want to do uh, do you usually work at this pace or are you faster off stream uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sculpting. I'm probably sculpting faster off stream. It's because I'm doing a lot of questions as well. In ter pure, terms of pure like mechanical movement, how fast I'm moving the pen, probably quite similar. But uh, yeah, if if I just have my little my Metallica, my headphones, and uh, just have good reference on and uh, some Red Bull, it's quite it's quite speedy. <laughs> <laughs> definitely faster now because what i'm doing now as well is, is a lot of noodling around just like kind of trying to refine some certain areas it's really hard to really think about the sign and talk at the same time Yeah, kind of happy with how this guy is is turning out. Uh, enjoying the overall process of him. Uh, Kitten is asking: Is the Ben Air course fully real time, or does it have time lapses? Twenty three hours seems like uh, very fast for a full character. Yeah, th th this is the case with a course like this. The course I released, the masterclass for the characters, that's a much smaller scope, and that's uh, that's all real time. But it's not possible to do Ben's course in twenty three hours, however long it is. Uh, to do that all real time so uh, ben's course definitely has has some time lapses and it also has some 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 jump cuts as well let's say your scope this this part here might be real time for the character like getting to this point but then the next five hours is just refinement that that stuff is just cut out and it just takes it to the next level basically the course assumes that you already know how to sculpt characters to a fairly decent level and you understand the overall steps and such uh, like uh, the specific baking settings is not going to be used but that's also not the point of that the point is to like learn something like that it would be like if if tolkien was teaching at was teaching literature he wouldn't he shouldn't teach you the specific grammar he should teach you how to create the world of tolkien he shouldn't like oh what settings do you use in word like just the writing settings you know like it, you it, it's more about like when you have somebody of that level is really more about their approach to things how do they think about it instead of the highly technical things all is to say yes there are some time lapses and some things are skipped because it's just not feasible to do it in a uh, 20 something hour course and if the course was 70 hours long <laughs> nobody would watch that long of a course and it would also be practically impossible to create for somebody who has a full-time job like ben has you who works at blizzard what is the thing on your arm i've had an injury due to too much sculpting what is your best advice on topic this is a sculpting glove uh it's called what is it called uh can't actually find a name. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's not in production anymore. <laughs> I've been trying to buy a new one. It's full of holes and it's nasty. <laughs> but um, basically, you can just search for sculpting gloves. I think COVID killed off the company who did it. They just aren't able to to find uh, like the, the supply chain shut down. So they aren't able to actually produce more of them. So um, unfortunately, that's not possible. But I, I need to have it because otherwise, 
it's not like my hand is crazy sweaty just just a tiny bit of sweat on your hand when you're sculpting so uh my hand just glides over the, the the tablet much much easier now so i i need this otherwise i get pain in my hands general advice for avoiding pain in your hands whenever you're sculpting is first wear a glove but then also take breaks go for walks and do that and do stretches as well uh, also if you are not sculpting i recommend a vertical mouse i have one of these this is a logitech mx i think it's called and that's really solid for uh, for general work like that i really i really like the that mouse for that so jump back into this so and i need to be able to see the chat All right. Yeah, so if anyone has any like cool companies, well, not cool companies, just companies that, that makes really nice sculpting gloves, please let me know <laughs> because I need I need something new. Uh, there was one I used, I used to have before called a smudge guard, but the one I have now is much better, but it's also years old at this point. It's going to be used until it uh, falls apart. You can see here the cool thing about this sculpt now is uh, if you haven't been following along, uh, if you have you have been following along from the beginning, you know I used uh, Flip Mode's Creature Kit for it. But if you haven't, uh, what I, the way I did this was pretty simple. I used this base mesh here, and I straight up just used something like the horn brush here. <laughs> I did like like this, zoop, and then we got a horn for it. And then I used um, uh, some other meshes here for it just to create this. So uh, it's a really cool kit uh, for for creating characters, and uh, you still have like the, the eyes here. I haven't sculpted the eyes. These are just the dragon brushes, the dragon uh, eyes from the the kit. What are your thoughts on Houdini? Great question. Uh, if I was a student today, I would be doing everything in my power to get good at Houdini. I think it's like one of the most powerful software out there. You can do basically everything in it. And I think you're going to be like a force multiplier for your team if you know how to use Houdini. So uh, yeah, learn, learn Houdini. <laughs> I highly recommend it. It's a tool I don't, I don't use myself uh, because, you know, now I'm a bit outside of industry uh, in terms of, you know, I produce courses now and it would take me a long while to be able to produce Houdini courses. Uh, and it's still not as popular as something like Blender or ZBrush or Painter in terms of pure like a commercial base for it. But um, Houdini, brilliant, brilliant piece of software. Yeah, Jared is saying, I think Houdini is the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Like, yeah, people have been talking about how, like, oh, Blender is taking over from Maya. Now, Maya is kind of going a little bit away in the industry, but it's not going towards Blender in terms of, like, at least not, like, film. It's it it's going towards Houdini. You know, you still wouldn't necessarily do modeling and such there, but uh, you can. But uh, it's, just, it's just a great overall tool because you can kind of do everything there. What do you think is worth learning more, Houdini or Unreal? Depends on what you want to do. If you want to be a, uh, if you want to be a game artist, then absolutely Unreal. Uh, it's still useful to know Houdini if you're in games as well, for sure. But uh, you know, if you're if you're games artist, you need to know a game engine anyway. So uh, yeah, it really just depends on what you want to do. Both are are fantastic tools. Both like Houdini and Unreal, they're they're like kind of future tools. They look like good, modern, well developed tools. Well, tools of Maya. Maya, Maya is, for me is a tractor, and I and I don't mean that in in derogatory sense. I mean it in the sense that it's like a powerhouse, but it's also kind of slow. <laughs> so, and it's not like yeah, it is an active development, but it at least from from the outside, it seems like development has slowed down a little bit. They're, they're developing a lot of really hardcore features, though, like Bifrost and Arnold and all that. But it's hard to say exactly what's being updated. Well, it seems like um, Houdini is more in active development though it's hard to say basically when i see releases for uh, when i see yearly releases of maya there aren't really that big changes but when i see like the release videos for dini there's always cool stuff coming out of those
Yeah, uh, Jengi is saying, Houdini is extra great for tech artists. The Vex language is really similar to Python, but it's pretty easy for, even for an artist to understand. Yeah. Well, I say, yeah, I've never used <laughs> never used Houdini, but yeah, I, I hear the same things from people in the industry. The cool thing about Houdini is that you can do all sorts of stuff there, from like big infrastructure pipeline things, like lighting, rendering, to... Uh, to like fall on effects to just using it as a look dev and lighting tool integrates really well with tools like Arnold as well all right just need to take a second now to evaluate the design that's something that's really important to do just evaluate the design a way to evaluate the design can be to uh, go into like a different view and just draw on top of it like uh, you can of course look here as well uh, but it, it can be helpful just to draw on top just because that way you're kind of forced to uh, to like make decisions or forced to like evaluate the different shapes so let's see if there's something cool we can do it's important to look at it from all angles as well i think i want to make it wider What effects do you think AI will have in the industry? Great question. Short answer is literally no idea. The tools that are popping up now, they're such, they're so, so early in its uh, in its development. They're doing incredible things. We basically have no idea what's coming. Like, with, if you add like exponential growth to something like that, like what can, like maybe the tool is going to revolutionize the industry it comes out in like two years impossible to say great question what are you using to draw on top what i'm using to draw on top is called epic pen it's a really really solid tool you see here i have some hotkey set up so i can just like change the color real quick so like this uh, i can really just like play around with this really 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 powerful tools i use this all the time and i have a stream deck as well so i can just very quickly just clear it so i have a hotkey for just clicking here this is a physical button and then i have just some hotkeys for different things so i can just very quickly draw on top so if you are interested in in this this is called epic pen obviously no affiliation with these guys i just use it a lot so i used to do like screenshots on top with a tool called Lightshot, but uh, then you have to draw it out and all that this is just a million times easier to work with. Uh, question by Mike Kant. If you want to get into character art, would you say Seabrush, Houdini, Marvelous Designer, Maya, Blender, Photoshop is the way to go? Ooh, that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, if you want to get into character art, I recommend that you basically you you spend a lot of time on, on sculpting get good at sculpting and then find a texture software you enjoy because you need that as well and then find a main 3d software you enjoy doing and fits with uh, the industry you want to work with and and then just spend a lot of time building characters you can learn a lot of specific stuff in the industry like specifically how it does vertex ordering reordering all that kind of stuff works but you need to get solid at sculpting and I re really recommend getting solid texturing as well though that's obviously not needed like you could you could be 100% a modeler or 100% texture artist for for characters but I really recommend get good at sculpting like that for me that's like the foundation for everything but I wouldn't say that Houdini is essential for a character artist it's 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 a much 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 better idea if you want to be a character artist get good at sculpting in ZBrush and you can pick up Houdini later on Meaning that somebody who's good at sculpting and doesn't know Houdini is going to have a much bigger chance at getting a texturing or getting a character artist job than somebody who is like okay-ish at sculpting but knows Houdini. A 
All right, I think it's time for me to move some, uh, to give this guy some eyes. And luckily there are some eyeballs in here. We have some cat eyeballs. So I'm just gonna copy, then paste. This is a feature that they added, maybe not recently, who knows when they added this, but at least it's uh, it exists, so you can just copy paste between different subtools, between different tools rather, really useful stuff. Just move this up like so. Any thought on SIVA Dynamics versus Houdini Muscle System? Nope, <laughs> no idea. Never used any one of them. They use like they, they look like solid tools, both of them. So, uh, but yeah, that that's a thing you wanna you just wanna in general be careful with if you're um, if you're asking feedback about different tools or workflow or your own work and such. If you're asking people like me for uh, for uh, who you know has been a professional and, and knows general three D don't assume that everyone knows everything it's very easy to assume that oh because you're working in the vfx industry or you work in games that you know everything there is to know about that that's just not the case if i've never worked with siva it doesn't matter if you've been an npc or dna or anything like that it's just you just will not have you just will not have any any expertise in that all this is to say if you are interested in these kind of these kind of tools uh, just uh, make sure to find somebody who uh, who knows how these tools are working and go and go with those people for instance, if you want to learn grooming, talk to people like Mike, who's in the chat here. Don't talk to people like me, <laughs> because he's gonna know he's gonna know that like a million times better than than what I could ever do. I think it's really important in general. Just if you if you want to to know how something is done in the industry, talk to people who is who has done it. Like I'm very honest about the fact that like if there are gaming questions, I I I'm gonna just preface that but the fact that i've not worked in games and um, there is of course some general truths just in any industry but just just be aware that just because somebody is like quote unquote a professional does not mean that they have universal knowledge or anything How can you get around competing with badass students, junior, for jobs? As an older artist, I find studios prefer younger, cheaper artists. They have better tools and portfolios anyways. Yeah, it's a tricky one. That's an interesting question. I mean, if you can beat them on quality, then hopefully you should be good. <laughs> but it's hard to say. It's a, it's a very open -ended question. I find that like the industry doesn't really discriminate against age. But uh, it, it's I've seen people who's been in their forties who's starting who's starting the first job in the industry, and I've seen people who's been like seventeen who's doing the same thing. So it, it's really it's really about the portfolio. If you have a portfolio, you're gonna beat the pesky little juniors. So I'm trying to make this guy feel a little scarier. So because currently he doesn't look particularly scary, <laughs> so I just really just want to do that. Maybe I can. What I can do is I can. I just want to add symmetry to this. I can like rotate one of these eyes around, just so like he will, he will blink like he will look like sideways or something. Yeah, I think that might actually work. You can just alt click on the middle one here in the Google Maps icon, and that's just gonna like move it, move the pivot. Let's try this. Yeah, that's looking a little bit better. And yeah, just uh, just a reminder that um, everything is fifty percent off on uh, flip notes. And I guess you can see that down. Here, I'm not sure exactly which way my <laughs> at this point. Yeah, I can't see myself on camera, uh, but at least make sure that everything is. Uh, check out uh, our website. Everything is 50% off. So we have really cool tools like uh, 
let me show you one that I really like. This one, Introduction to, sorry, Switching to Blender for Experienced Artists. This is a really, really solid course for people who want to switch to Blender. One of the problems you have if you're switching to Blender is that, at least if you use 3D beforehand, is that they're just beginner tutorials. All of them are just beginner tutorials. And which is, while that's great if you're a beginner, if you already know how to model something well and you know how to render something, you know how to work with 3D, you just want somebody to tell you where they are. For instance, here, like, okay, this is Udems. This is where you find the Udem tools. There's no reason to explain the concept behind Udems. Oh, this is how you read topology or something. You don't have to explain the concept behind edge flow and such. So if you're interested in uh, switching to Blender, I highly recommend this one. This is one we made specifically for, basically for past Henning and Morton because switching to Blender was highly frustrating. <laughs> so uh, I highly recommend a uh, highly recommended tool if you are interested in switching to it. Blender is a fantastic tool. Like it's it's really added a lot to my workflow. I particularly really like the rendering there. It's not as powerful in terms of like pure like features as something like Arnold, but it's really, really fast to work with. It's very interactive and it's so much more iterative than what you can do in um, in Maya. Like Maya is Maya is a case where you can, you know, you can render stuff in Arnold and such, but it's so fast to do lookative changes in uh, in Blender, so I really like it for that. Particularly for the work I'm doing now, like doing characters like this is is an absolute treat to do in Blender. Would you say it will be a must to learn Blender? No, absolutely not. Uh, we just it depends just entirely what industry you're in and uh, where it goes in the future. We don't know where Blender is going in the future. We don't know what's going to be the dominant tool in five years. It's hard to say. It's the same thing as it's not a must to learn Maya today, even though Maya is probably one of the most industry standard tools. Plenty of 3D artists never use Maya. They might be working in a company that only uses Max or only use Houdini or like anything else. Is Max used at all now? Yeah, Max is used a lot still. In Archivist, for instance, it's used, uh, used a lot. Uh, generally, Max is, is still a, still a pretty popular tool. It's a very solid tool as well. I used it not too long ago and um, still really like using Max. I know a lot of people don't like using Max, but personally, I, I think Max is a great tool. Like the modifier stack is incredibly powerful. I find the modifier stack to be much more powerful in Max than it is in Blender. Also, you have the case that uh, uh, it's the same thing we spoke about before. If you if you guys were here, then in terms of uh, why is like the cost of Blender or oh, Blender is free, but it's not free. It's the same thing with uh, with Max as well. If you have an established workflow within a company, and everyone is using Max, in order to switch around from Max to something else, it's got to be so much better. Like you're not just talking like a little bit better. You can't it can't be like one like ten percent better. It's got to be significantly better. Are there any advantages and disadvantages of being an engineer in computer science, but no arts background? Depends entirely what it is you want to do. If you want to, uh, if you want to do some of the more artistic sides of uh, the 3D industry, like concept art or like character art is also pretty artistic, then you just you need artistic skills. Like there's no just no way about that. You need to understand anatomy and all that. But in general, in the creative industry, there are so many jobs for people with a computer science background. Like the, the amount of programming needed, like, I mean, I'm using software now for everything. People have to do that. People have to build scripts as well. So if, you, if you're good at programming and you, um, and you want to get into industry, there are a bunch of jobs for you there. Probably it's also easier to learn Houdini as well. And then you can really leverage Houdini. Do you prefer modifiers in Blender or tools in Maya in terms of non-destructive workflows? Oh, definitely Blender. I think the I think the modifier stack in um, in Blender is much better than than how it works in uh, in Maya. Maya is powerful for sure. Maya is node based, so you can do a lot of really cool, interesting things with the uh, modifiers or with the deformers and such there. But from like a day to day, I, I definitely prefer the, how it works in Blender. Though I prefer how it works in Max even more than that. But that might just be personal preference. Been a while since I was a proper hardcore Max user. One of the cool things in Max is you can have like edit poly gun modifiers. Basically, 
you can use do like all sorts of like polygonal modeling as essentially as layers. So you can just like test it out. You can you can just select a polygon, extrude it out. You can do all sorts of cool stuff with it, and then you can just like delete it later on. So for iterations, it's really really useful. Maya is huge with a sweep mesh they added. Yeah, we just did a video I don't know, a year ago or something <laughs> on sweep mesh. Sweep mesh is, is a really, really powerful tool. If you're using any kind of curves or something like that, sweep mesh is probably the coolest curve tool I've ever used. Blender is really cool for curves uh, as well because you can do like you can twist the curve and you can add a radius to the curve, but not like globally. You can add a specific radius to a specific point, which is brilliant but sweet mesh is, is just like overall the coolest tool i've ever used when it comes to uh, when it comes to curves the amount of uh, power you have in that tool is, is bonkers what i'm trying to do here as well is i'm trying to give him lips so like lips wrapping around it so we have here we have like lips wrapping around here i'm trying to make sure that it feels like the skin is compressing a little bit here so i need to do that a little bit more on the bottom here as well What you want to be sure of as well, whenever you're sculpting carrots like this, you want to break up symmetry, at least along the center line. I haven't done a whole lot of that left uh, yet, but uh, I probably will. It's just really important to break that up. One thing I always struggle with is losing details as a subdivide up. Any tips on not having to work over areas again and again? No. Uh, <laughs> no tips. That's just how you do it. You just work up areas over and over again. That's just how it works when you're sculpting the zebras, really. Like, you don't lose details. Stuff just gets softer when you when you subdivide. There's just more resolution to play with. It's like if you had a document that was, uh, that was 1K in, in Photoshop and you had to make it 2K or 4K, it would just be there would just be more pixels so it just appears to be softer that's just that's just really how you do it you just keep iterating on top of the same areas over and over again it's not like a limitation or something it's just just how it works How does one get a scholarship at a 3D university or college? I'm going to A-levels and I want to go to a 3D uni and I got zero ideas on the progress. Uh, I've absolutely no idea. Uh, <laughs> never got any scholarships in my life. Good question though. Uh, not aware if, I haven't really heard of anyone who got scholarships. I guess since you're talking about, uh, about doing A-levels that you're in the UK. Not really heard about anyone. I'm currently in the UK as well now. Not heard by anyone in the UK who's been really given scholarships to study 3D. What do you suggest to do when somebody is four hours in a sculpt and looks absolutely horrific and low pro and slow progress? Very mentally challenging. Yeah, kind of, kind of two ways here. Either you're in what's called the Valley of the Suck. I think that was something Ryan Kingsland came up with. Basically, you have a point where it might look 
good in the beginning <laughs> and you know this maybe this stage here of the character where it's like it's starting to to get there and then you might subdivide it and you and you might just be in a, in a slump where it just goes down your visual perception just goes down there's always an area where it just starts to look like crap and then you just have to go from here now the question is are you down here and it just and it will get better or is the model just not good enough that that sometimes happens as well where you just forgot some key areas you forgot to look for reference you forgot to add the uh you forgot to add like the bones and the anatomy is wrong and all that then in that case then revisit it i go back make sure to look at the anatomy look at the bones make sure everything is correct and sometimes you just gotta give it up that's just the unfortunate truth sometimes the work is just it's just bad like that that's my experience maybe it's different from other people but you just gotta just gotta scuttle that model and just start over again uh, there are times where i've been trying for a long time to, to fix something and it's everything should in theory be fixable but from a practical point of view it's just just not gonna work so yeah sometimes the easiest way is just like just to get rid of it you have a, you have a fallacy called sunken cost fallacy it basically just means that you've been spending a lot of time on something so you just have to keep spending more time on it well you know you already spent four hours you might as well just see it through no you already wasted four hours if it's if, ne if it's never going to work then you might as well just stop right now and then uh, and then just just start something else but yeah, it depends from scope to scope. Impossible to really say that without knowing your skill level, knowing your, knowing um, the scope itself. Because this happens to everyone as well. Like no matter how good the person I'm talking to is, everyone is like, "Yep, some point in the scope, just feel like crap." I still do that whenever I'm sculpting, like where you're just like severely doubting your own skills. <laughs> that is very demoralizing. <laughs> What is the tray right and tray left and zero X? That is an excellent question. I have absolutely no idea. So let you let you know what's going on, why they're here. So I have um I have some macros up here, and this is for the face kit. And um, uh, we're currently developing our um, we're currently developing some new tools as well. And uh, I'm changing the interface up a little bit. So these ones here should really just be replaced with. Um, macros uh, custom macros here which are hard edge soft edge and mid value 50. Uh, i just haven't done it yet <laughs> doing it now and um uh, yeah that's the story there there's no secret feature you didn't know about these are just uh, these are just uh, macros for uh, for making sure the flipmos face kit and skin kit are working correctly mid value 50 just goes under alpha modify and it just sets the mid value which is here to 50. And the uh, hard edge just sets the focal shift to minus 100, and soft edge sets it to zero. Alright, we're almost getting to the point where this guy here can be uh, can be uh, smooth or a little bit or turn into a um, turn into a uh, subdivision level model. Let's see. Just want to refine it a little bit more. Why do you need a different focal shift for hard edge? Basically, let me show you what's going on. So if I have the standard brush and I were to load in something like, uh, we have the face kit young, this one here. Let's say we should load something from the skin kit here. So I have this guy here. Hi, for there, this one here, elephant skin. This one's pretty cool. So let's say I'm, I'm doing this and I want to, uh, to drag it out like so. There are a few issues with this. The first one is that you can't actually see it here, but the whole thing is just like increasing elevation. You don't want that. So then you have to just admit value. And now you can see it doesn't change elevation. So now you have the, these details here. Just gonna subdivide real quick so you can see it. So now you have these details, but you can see it's now blending. You see the, the edges are soft. If I set this to hard edge, then it's gonna look like this. So the soft edge, it's going to look like this. 
So this, for instance, is, is nice if you want to like blend them together like this. Uh, but the soft edge is, or the hard edge is really good if you want to, uh, if you have like a specific shape here and you don't want to like just work it in like so. So uh, yeah, that's what soft edge and hard edge is doing. Maybe there are actually some alphas I can use for this just to like create some chaos. <laughs> that's something I often want to do when it comes to creating a character like this. You just want to add some alphas to it, not necessarily as the final thing, but just so that you can create some like general grunge or chaos in the model as well. Maybe in the back here, we just want something like this. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, no, we can do that later though. But yeah, this is a really, really powerful kit. Uh, I can just show you this actually. This is like a really cool way of just adding these kind of details to it. This is the um, this is the Flip Normals uh, uh, skin kit. Just send you this and you send you guys this here. So this is super cool. I can actually just show you how you can use this. Just gonna make it on layer because there's a chance that my undo history goes bye bye. And then I just have to, <laughs> to destroy it all. So the cool thing about the, the skin kit is that you can do these kind of details like this. You can also go in and you can just change this to something like this. You can do pores like this. You can just do pores like this. We can set this to soft edge. And then we can just add pores like this. Obviously on a character like this, you wouldn't necessarily want to do this because it's more of a creature. And then you can go to like reptile. This is really cool. And you can just go in here, we can just add like reptile skin along his neck. And the cool thing about this is you can you can go in, you can sculpt over this later on and you can really just get like quick and uh, not even dirty, just quick and, and nice skin details like this. So I don't really think there are a whole lot of alphas out there that can do this kind of stuff at, uh, at like um, a faster pace. So, uh, the uh, the skin kit is, is is a brilliant kit, at least I think so. <laughs> but I'm very biased here as well. So it means how you can see how quickly you can actually get covered here. You can also go in here, and we can try some of the other ones. This is like rhino skin, really cool as well. So we can go in here, and we can do this, and now you can just see you get this like nice, cool rhino skin here. Of course, don't do this until the skin the sculpt is properly working. But yeah, you get coverage all the way like this. Uh, and link in the, if you just scroll up a little bit now, link a little bit up. And then if you just, this one as well is super cool. This is similar to what we talked about briefly before as well. This is just like an overall like variation. If you just want to get some pimples or something. This is kind of the ones, it's a funny one because this took me like five minutes to make. I just sculpted this on a plane and extracted it. But this is probably the one I use the most. So let's look at some other ones. We have some wrinkles as well. Uh, let's look at... This one is very cool. This one is a, is a pretty good general skin texture. And the cool thing is that they're made so that they're going to flow into each other as well. Even with that like hard edge, they're really just going to flow into each other. So if we delete the layer, make a new one, and we do something in the back here, you can see that we can really just like make them flow so it doesn't look tiled or anything. Uh, you, can, you can just move it around like this as well. I also have, an, I have a button using my interface as well, just on a, on a texture, I think it's texture. Yeah, it's, uh, no, it will be alpha. And then you can just like flip V and flip uh, H just so you get even more variation in it. So yeah, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the skin kit for you. I'm just gonna delete the uh, subdivision levels now. You can also get this interface on flip as well. That's a perfectly free interface. So you can just search for like, interface on flip normals and there is a free product there which you can which you can get uh Jengi is saying i bought the flip normal sculpting tour last year and it was extremely helpful for helping me learn to sculpt plugging it the rules thank you so much really appreciate that uh, i suppose that's the um the intro to sculpting course that is one of the most like it was most, one of the most fun courses I made, but my God, it was also one of the hardest ones. It's basically at that point, I've been sculpting this since 2006 now, like June, 2006, I think. And trying to get all, all of that, all the knowledge from those years into a course, also all the bad habits, all the good habits, and trying to simplify all those concepts into a course, that is really hard. If it comes to just like, oh, this is how you, this is how you model a specific thing. That's more straightforward because there is, well, this is just how you model that thing. But if you if it comes to teaching some deep fundamentals, man, that's hard. So 
So, all right, we are going to um, to stop the stream right here. So, Morton and I will be back actually pretty soon with um, with a stream where we do it, where we just do it all together. Where Morton is going to be sculpting. We've been doing it for almost two hours now, so this has been uh, tons of fun, and we'll be back pretty soon. So, uh, yeah, this is what we did in this stream, just from a uh, just without any direction. I had no idea where I was going to go with this. Like you can see up here. <laughs> Here's what I started with, just playing around, and it was like, nah, it doesn't work. And then I went and used the creature kit, and I just like, well, let's just see what happens if I just kind of throw in a horn here. Oh, that's kind of cool. Let's use that idea to take it further. So yeah, cool. Um, we're going to be online in not too long. I don't know exactly how long. I just need a 10 hour break until the next one. Then Morton's going to be sculpting, and I'm going to be doing questions. And remember, uh, everything is, nearly everything, 50% off on um, the Flip Normals, Flip Normals Marketplace including the Flip Normals Creature Kit and the Flip Normals uh, Skin Kit. So yeah, see you guys.